This play is Ireland of the tenement houses of Dublin, where the poorer walkers lived, and where many of them are living still. It is 1922, the time of the Troubles, the Civil War. Within the tenement, there were those who drank too much. There were those who loved too much. There was much singing and a lot of laughter. But beyond and within the echoes of the laughter and the singing, and beyond and within the light that love gave, there was darkness and sorrow and death. This then is Ireland, Ireland of the Dublin tenements in the time of the hateful civil war, when those who had fought so long together as comrades became bitter enemies, and Irishmen again tore the cords of Ireland's heart to sunder. We are in the living room of a two-room tenancy occupied by the Boyle family in a tenement house in Dublin. It is a poverty-stricken room with a dresser against the back wall and a window looking into the yard at the back of the house. Between the dresser and the window is a picture of the Blessed Virgin. Below the picture on a bracket is a crimson bowl in which a floating boat of light is burning. On a table are breakfast things for one. On the mantelpiece is an alarm clock lying on its face. A teapot is on the hob and a frying pan stands beside the fender. Johnny Boyle with an arm missing lost in a fight with the British, is sitting crouched before the fire. His sister Mary is arranging her hair before a tiny mirror perched on the table. Beside the mirror, the morning paper is spread out, which she looks at when she isn't gazing into the mirror. She is a well-made and good-looking girl of 22. Two forces are walking in our mind. One, through the circumstances of her life, pulling her back. The other, through the influences of books she has read, forcing her forward. The opposing forces are apparent in her speech and her manners, both of which are hurt by her environment and improved by her acquaintance, slight though it be, with literature. Mrs. Boyle, who enters upon the scene has been shopping and carries a small parcel. She is 45 years old and 20 years ago was a handsome woman but she has lost a lot of her good looks through hard and constant work and the anxiety for the home that always besets her. She is the one who keeps the home together a heroine who will never have her name in the papers, never have a memorial, nonetheless one of Whitman's heroines among greatest heroines known. Captain Boyle, who makes his imposing entrance after five minutes or so, full of himself, he wishes that the world would be full of him too. He's a man of 65, stout, grey-haired, and stucky. His neck is short and his head looks like the stone ball one sees on the top of a gate post. He walks with a slow consequential strut and wears a faded seaman's cap with a glazed peak. His buddy, the cautiously stepping joxer, is younger than the captain but he looks older. His face is like a bundle of crinkled paper. He is spare and loosely built. He has a habit of constantly shrugging his shoulders with a peculiar twitching movement meant to be ingratiating. His face is invariably ornamented with a grin, a sly and a hopeful one. The one other character who requires any introduction from me is Mrs. Maisie Madigan, who first appears in Act Two. She is a strong, 
dapper little woman of about 45. Her face is almost always a widespread smile of complacency. She is a woman who, in manner at least, can mourn with them that mourn and rejoice with them who do rejoice. When she is feeling comfortable, she is inclined to be reminiscent. When others say anything, or following a statement made by herself, she has a habit of putting her head a little to one side and nodding it rapidly, like a bird pecking at a hard belly. Indeed, she has a good deal of the bird in her, but the bird instinct is by no means a melodious one. She is ignorant, vulgar and forward, but her heart is generous with all. For instance, she would willingly help a neighbor's sick child. She would probably kill the child, but her intentions would be good. She would be more at home helping a drayman to lift a fallen horse. She wears a rather soiled gray dress and a vivid purple blouse. In her hair is a huge comb ornamented with big colored beads. She makes her entrance with a gliding step, beaming smile and nodding head. She is in the party mood, and perhaps I should warn the listener that she will be persuaded to give the party a song. But that is not till the second act. The first act happens in the early forenoon. A few days elapse between the first and the second acts, and two months between Act 2 and Act 3. Here, then, is my Juno and the Paycock, a tale of the Dublin tenements, the time of the Troubles, the time of the Civil War in Ireland. Hasn't he come in yet? No, Mother. Oh, he'll come in when he likes. Strutting about the town like a peacock with Jack, sir, I suppose. Oh, you're all about Mrs. Tancred's son is in this morning's paper. Mm, the full details are in it this morning. On a little by road out beyond Thingless, he was found. Seven wounds he had, one entering the neck, with an exit wound beneath the left shoulder blade, another in the left breast penetrating the heart. Oh, quit that reading, for God's sake! Are you losing all your feelings? Assume me that none of you will read anything that's not about butchering. He's getting very sensitive all of a sudden. I'll read to myself, Mary, boy and boy, when I come home. Everybody's saying that he was a die-hard. Thanks be to God that Johnny had nothing to do with him this long time. Ah, then if that father of yours doesn't come in soon for his breakfast, he may go without any. I'll not wait much longer for him. Ah, can't you let him get it himself when he comes in? Yes, and let him bring in Jacks or Daly along with him. Aye, that's what he'd like, and that's what he's waiting for till he thinks I'm gone to work, and then sail in with the bowl Jacks or to burn all the coal and drink all the tea in the place, <laughs> to show them what a good Samaritan he is. But I'll stop here till he comes in, if I have to wait till tomorrow morning. Do you like this ribbon on me hair, ma? Mother. Yes? Bring us in a drink of water. Bring in that fella, drink of water, for God's sake, Mary. Isn't he big and able enough to come out and get it himself? If you weren't well yourself, you'd like somebody to bring in a glass of water. I'll bring it in myself. Well, I don't think this blue one suits me. Oh, isn't it terrible to have to be waiting this way? Captain Boy, you think he was bringing 20 pounds a week into the house the way he's going on? He wore out the health insurance long ago. He's after wearing out the unemployment doll. And now he's trying to wear out me. And constantly singing, no less, when he ought always to be on his knees offering up a novena for a job. I don't like this ribbon, Ma. I think I'd wear the green. It uh, looks better than the blue. Ah, wear whatever ribbon you like, girl, only don't be bothering me. I don't know what a girl on strike wants to be wearing a ribbon round her head for. Or silk stockings on our legs, either. It's wearing them things that make the employers think they're giving us too much money. The hour is past now, when we'll ask the employers' permission to wear what we like. 
I don't know why you wanted to walk out for Jenny Claffy. Up to this, you never had a good word for her. Uh, what's the use of belonging to a trade union if you won't stand up for your principles? Why did they sack her? It was a clear case of victimisation. We couldn't let her walk the streets, now could we? No, of course you couldn't. You wanted to keep her company. One victim wasn't enough. When the employer sacrificed one victim, the trades unions go on better be sacrificing a hundred. Look, it doesn't matter what you say, ma. Principles are principles. Yes, and when I go into Old Morphy's tomorrow and he gets to know that instead of paying all, I'm going to borrow more, what'll he say when I tell him a principle's a principle? What'll we do if he refuses to give us any more on tick? Sure he daren't refuse if he does, can't you tell him he's paid? It's looking as if he was paid, whether he refuses or no. I was lying down, the touches were gone. Old Simon Mackey is tramping about upstairs like a horse over me head, and I can't sleep with them. They're like thunderclaps in me brain. The course... God forgive me for gone, of course. There now. Go back and lie down again. And I'll bring you in a nice cup of tea. Tea, tea, tea. You're always taking a tea. If a man was dying, you'd try to make him swallow your cup of tea. Oh, I don't know what's going to be done with him. The bullet he got in the hip in Easter week was bad enough, but the bomb that shattered his arm in the fight in O'Connell Street put a finishing touch on him. I knew he was making a fool of himself. God knows, I went down on me bended knees to him, not to go again the free stage. Well, he stuck to his principles, and no matter how you may argue, ma, a principle's a principle. Is Mary going to stay here? No, I'm not going to stay here. You can't expect me to be always at your beck and call, can you? Well, I won't stop here by myself. I'm a nicely handicapped with the hole he is. I don't know what Annie is to do without your ma. Your father be here in a minute, Johnny. And if you want anything, he'll get it for you. Well, he'd ask him for anything. He hates to be asked to store. Is the light lighting before the picture of the Virgin? Yes, yes. The one inside to St. Anthony isn't enough, but you must have another one to the Virgin here. Where's the captain? Where's the captain, Mrs. Boyle? You may well ask the body that. He's wherever Jacks or Daly is, drinking in some snug or another. The father files just have to stop me, to tell me to run up and get him to go on the new job that's going on in Rat Mines. His cousin is foreman of the job, and Father Farrell was speaking to him about poor Johnny and his father being idle so long. And the foreman told Father Farrell to send the captain up and he'd give him a start. I wonder where I could find him. He'll find him. Either in Ryan's or Foley's. Well, I'll run round to Ryan's. I know it's a great house of Jackson's. There now. He'll miss that job, or I know for what. If he gets win of the award, he'll not come back to evening, so that'll be too late. There'll never be any good got out of him so long as he goes with that shoulder shrugging Jackson. I killing myself walking. And he's Strutting about from morning till night like a peacock. Sweet spirit here. Oh, here they are now. Will I slip behind these curtains and take a start out of them buckles? Come on, come on in, Jock, sir. Yeah. She's gone out long ago, man. If there's nothing else to be got, we'll forage out a cup of tea anyway. Ah, yeah. It's the only bit I get in comfort when she's away. You know, it isn't you know she'll be her pet name at all. But dear dear the Saris, she's always grousing. Ah, oh, it's a terrible thing to be tied to a woman that's always grousing, Jack. I don't know how you stick it. It'd have put years on me, so it would. <laughs> it's a good job she has to be so off now, away for... Uh, when the cat's away, the mice can play. <laughs> pull over, pull over to the fire, Jocks, and we'll have a cup of tea in a minute. Yeah, I said a cup of tea's a darning thing, a darning thing. The cup, the chairs. Pull over to oh, the oh, fire, oh, oh, Jocks, the... daily, and we'll have a cup of tea in a minute. Are you sure now you wouldn't like an egg? I, I, I can't stop, Mrs. Mullen. I'm in a desperate hurry. Pull yeah, over to the hurry. fire, Jocks, daily. People is always far more comfortable here than they are in their own place. Uh, Jocks, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the foreman of that job that's going on down in Calester, don't you, Jocker? The, the foreman in Calester? He's a buddy of yours, isn't he? The foreman of... Oh, yeah, yes, yes, Jack. Oh, he's an old buddy of mine, sir. <laughs> he's a darling man, a darling man. Ah, then it's a sure thing. It's a pity we didn't go down a breakfast first thing this morning. 
we might have been working now, but you didn't know it then, did you? No, no, no. Oh, it's better late than never. It's nearly time we got a start. Anyhow, I'm fed up knocking around, doing nothing. He promised you. He gave you the straight tip, huh? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Come down on the blow of dinner, to see, and I'll start you. And any friend you like to bring with you. Ah, so so you're a darling man, a darling man. Well, it couldn't come at a better time. We're a long time waiting for it. Oh, indeed we were, Jack. But it's a long line that has no turning. The blow up for dinner is at one. Here, wait till I see what time it is. Why now, how you go on fiddling with that clock? You know the least little thing sets it astray. The job couldn't come at a better time. I feel it in great battle juncture. Ah. I can hardly believe I ever had the pain of me legs. Last week I was crippled with them. Oh, sure, better and better. Well, sure, God never shut one door but he opened another. It's only 11 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, we've lessened the time. Yes. I'll slip on me moleskins after breakfast and we can saunter down at our ears. Do you know, I think, Doctor, we better bring our shovels. Yes, Captain, yes, yes. Better to go fully prepared and ready for all eventualities. You bring your long-tailed shovel and I'll bring me navvy. We mightn't want them and then again, we might. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. And for want of a horse, the man was lost. That's it. It's a darling proverb. A darling proverb. Get to yes, hell out of this, Jocks, or daily. Uh, we won't, won't be long pulling ourselves together again when I'm walking for a few weeks. The, the, the foreman on the job is an old buddy of Juxers. I, I've an idea I know myself. There's a button off the back of me moleskin trousers. If you leave out a needle and thread, I sew it on myself. Anyway. Thanks be to God, the pains of me legs is gone, and he has... Look here, Mr. Jackie Boyle. Them yarns won't go down with you now. I know you and Jack Sir Daly have an old date. And if you think you're able to come over me with them fairy tales, you're in the wrong shop. <coughs> oh, but here, Jocks, and you'll do a lot of good as long as you continue to be a but here, Jocks. Uh. Shovel, uh, them here by you. You do far more work with a knife and fork than ever you'll do with a shovel. If there was ever a genuine job going, you'd be the other way about. Not able to lift your arms with the pains in your legs. Mm. Your poor wife slaving to keep the bit in your mouth. And you gallivanting about all the day like a peacock. Yeah, it'd be better for a man to be dead. It'd Everybody be better for a man to be... calling you captain. And you only once on the water. In an old collier from here to Liverpool. When anybody to listen to or look at you... I'll take you for a second, Christopher Columbus. Hey, look, are you never going to give us a rest? Oh, you're never tired of looking for a rest. Do, do you want to drive me out of the house? It'll be easier to drive you out of the house than to drive you into a job. Here, sit down and take your breakfast. And maybe the last you'll get, for I don't know where the next is going to come from. Look, if I get this job, we'll be all right. Did you see Jerry Devine? No, I didn't see no, him. No, but you seen Jock, sir. Well, he was here looking for you. Well, let him look. Oh, indeed, he may well look. Or it'll be hard for him to see you when you were stuck in Ryan's snug. I wasn't in Ryan's snug. I don't go into Ryan's. Oh, is there a mad dog there? Well, if you weren't in Ryan's, you were in Foley's. I'm telling you, for the last three weeks, I haven't tasted a drop of intoxicating liquor. I wasn't in either one snug nor the other. I could swear that in a prayer book. I'm as innocent as the child on board. Well, if you've been in for your breakfast, you'd have seen him. What, what, what does he want me for? He'll be back any minute, and then you'll soon know. I'll drop out and see if I can meet him. You'll sit down and take your breakfast and let me go to me work, for I'm an hour late already waiting for you. Well, you needn't to wait it, for I'll take no breakfast. I've a little spirit left in me still. Are you going to have your breakfast? Yes or no? I'll have no breakfast. You can keep your breakfast. I'll knock out a bit somewhere, never fear. Nobody's going to coax you. Don't think that. I've a little spirit left in me still, so I have. Ah, oh, here you are at last. Look, I've been searching for you everywhere. The foreman of Foley told me he hadn't left a snug with Chucks for ten minutes before I went in. And he's swearing on the holy prayer book that he wasn't in no snug. Look, what business is it of yours whether I was in a snug or no? Well, look, what do you want to be galloping about after me for? Is a man not to be allowed to leave his house for a minute without having a pack of spies, pimps and informers cantered at his heels? Oh, now, you're taking a wrong view from Mr Boyle. I was simply anxious to do you a good turn. I have a message for you from Father Farrell. 
He says that if you go up to the job that's on Rat Mines and ask for Foreman Mangan, you get a start. That's all right. But I don't want the motions of me body to be watched the way an astronomer would watch a star. If you're following Mary yourself, you've no periodic to be following me. Oh, oh, I'm up to getting a terrible twinge in me right leg. Oh, it won't be very long now till it travels into your left one. It's miraculous that whenever he sends a job in front of him, his legs begin to fail him. Then, me bucko, if you lose this job, you may go and forage for yourself. This job will last for some time too, Captain, and as soon as the foundations are in, it'll be cushy enough. Won't it be a climbing job? How do you expect me to be able to up a ladder with these legs? And if I get up myself, how am I going to get down again? Guess one of the labourers is carry you down in a hod. You can't climb a ladder, but you can skip like a goat into a snug. I wouldn't let myself be let down that easy, Mr. Boyle. Little exercise now might do you all the good in the world. <laughs> it's a doctor you should have been, Divine. Maybe you know more about the pains in me legs than myself that has them. I know nothing about the pains in your legs. I brought the message that Father Farrell gave me and that's all I can do. Here, sit down and take your breakfast and go and get ready. And don't be acting as if you couldn't pull a wing out of a dead bee. I want no breakfast, I tell you. It, it, it'd choke me after all that's been said. I've a little spirit left to me still. Well, let's see your spirit then and go in at once and put on your moleskin trousers. it would be better for a man to be dead. Oh, oh, there's another twinge in me other leg. Nobody but myself knows the suffering I'm going through with the pains in these legs of mine. <sighs> I'll have to push off now, for I'm terrible late already. But I was determined to stay and hunt that jockster this time. Are you going out, Mary? It looks like it when I'm putting on my hat, doesn't it? And a bitter word again, Mary. Oh, look it. You won't allow me to be friendly with you. If I try, you deliberately misunderstand it. Oh, I didn't always misunderstand it. You're often delighted to have the arms of Jerry round you. If you go on talking like this, Jerry Devine, you'll make me hate you. Well, let it either be a wedding or a wake. Listen, Mary, I'm standing for the secretaryship of our union. There's only one opposing me. I'm popular with the men and a good speaker. All are saying that I get elected. Well? Well, the job's worth £350 a year, Mary. You and I could live nice and cosy in that. It lifts you out of this place Look, and I give haven't you time to listen to you now. Uh, Mary, I have to go. Mary, what's come over you the last few weeks? You, you hardly speak to me. Then only a word with a face of bitterness on it. Mary, have you forgotten all the happy evenings we used to have together? That's all over now. When you get your new job, Jerry, you won't be long finding a girl far better than I am for your sweetheart. Oh, never, never, Mary. No matter what happens, you'll always be the but same to me. I must be off. Please let me go, Jerry. Well, I, I'll go by the way with you. You needn't, thanks. I want to be by myself. You're going to meet another fella. You've clicked with somebody else, me lady. That's no concern of yours, Jerry. If I let me go. I saw you coming out of the cornflower dance class and you hanging on his arm. A thin, lanky strip of a Mickey Dazzler with a walking stick and gloves. You're hurting me. Ah, oh, let me go. Let me go or I'll scream and then you'll have the oil fell out on top of us. Ah, don't be so hard in a fella, Mary. Don't be so hard. What's the meaning of all this hillabaloo? Let me go. Let me go. Do you hear me? What's all the hillabaloo about? Will you not give us one kind word? One kind word, Mary. Do you hear me talking to you? What's all the hillabaloo for? Kiss your for? hand. Your little tiny white let hand. Your little tiny white hand. Are you taking leave of your senses, man? This is nice goings on in front of our father. Ah, dry up for God's sake. The chiselers don't care a damn now about their burdens. They're bringing their father's grey hairs with sorrow to the grave and laughing at us. Laughing at us. You see, I suppose the same everywhere. The whole world's in a state of chassis. Breakfast. Well, they can keep their breakfast for me. Not if they went down on their bended knees, would I take it. I'm sure there's a little spirit left to me still. Hmm. Sausage. Well, let I keep our sausage. Hmm. The, 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 the tea is wet right enough. Hmm. And the robins nest again. 
and the flowers are in bloom when the springtime sunny smile seems to banish all sorrow and gloom near me bunny blue-eyed lad if me heart be true to them he's promised he'll come back to me when the robins nest again Ain't you happen to want a sewing machine? No, I don't want there is sewing machine. Sewing machine. When the robins nest again and the flowers they are in blue Oh, that's a, that's a terrible tatterer, ah. Huh? That's a stranger. That, that's nobody belonging to the house. Hey, Jack, Jack. Did you hear them tatterer, ah, did you? Well, no, Jack, sir. I'm not Jack. Who's that at the door? Who's that at the door? Who gave that knock? Do you hear me? Are, are you deaf or drunk or what? How the hell do I know who it is? Jack, sir. Yeah? Stick your head out of the window and see. Oh, and maybe get a bullet in the kisser, ha oh. ha. None of them tricks for jog, sir. It's better be a coward than a corpse. <laughs> it's a it's a fella in a trench coat. Holy Mary, Mother of God! He's going away. It's all right, going away. He must have got tired knocking. Sit down and have a cup of tea, Jock, sir. Ah, uh, well, no, I'm afraid the missus are popping at us again. Before we knew where we were, something's telling me to go at once. Don't be superstitious, man. We're jubbling, man. And not by us that's only after coming up from the bog of Valen. Though if she did come in rising up, we'd be cut like rats in a trap. Yeah, and you know the sort she is, Jack. <laughs> she wouldn't listen to reason and one spitting toy shy. Yeah, well, if the worst comes to the worst, you could dart out the window here, Jack, sir. Yeah. It's only a drop of a few feet to the roof of the returning room. And the first minute she goes into the other room, I give you the bend, you can slip in and away. Oh, well, I won't stop very long, anyhow. Hey, uh, uh, who's this Bill? Oh, one of Mary's. She's always reading lately, nothing but trash, too. Uh -huh. There's one I was looking at the other day. Yeah. Three stories. The dog's house, ghosts, and the wild duck. Boops only fit for chiselers. Hey, Jack, uh, did you ever read Elizabeth of the Exile of Siberia? <laughs> it's a darling story, a, a darling story. Look, you, you eat your sausage now, and never mind the Exile of Siberia. What are you wearing the most skin trousers for? I have to go to a job, Jack, sir. Oh, job? Just after you gone, Devine came running in to tell us that Father Farden said, if I went down to the job that's going on in Rap Mines, I'd get a start. Ah, oh, be the holy, that's good news. And how was it good news? Huh? I wonder if you were in my condition, would you call it good news? Oh, well, Jack, I, I thought... You that... thought? You think too sudden sometimes, Jock, sir. You know, I'm hardly able to crawl with the pains in my legs. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about the pains in your legs. I know you can do nothing while they're at you. You forgot. I don't think any has realised the state I'm in with the pains in my legs. What would happen if I had to carry a bag of cement? Ah, sure, any man having the look of them pants, I'd be down and out, down and out. Yeah, I wouldn't mind if he said it to myself. Oh, no, no, oh, no. He rushes in and shouts it out in front of Juno. And you know what Juno is, Joxer. Now, we all know Devine knows a little more than the rest of us. But he doesn't act as if he did. He's a good boy, sober, able to talk and all that, but still... Oh, I Able to argue for him, but still... If he's running after Mary yourself, he's not going to be running after me. Captain Boyle's able to take care of himself. After all, I'm not getting brought up on Voyager. That's right, Jack. I never heard him using a curse. I don't believe he was ever drunk in his life. He's not like a Christian at all. You're out of taking the words out of my mouth. After all, a Christian's natural. But he's unnatural, so he is. His overflow is just the same. A wickler man. Oh, a wickler man. Ah, well, that explains the whole thing. I met many a wickler man in my time, but I never met one that was any good. 
Father Fattle, says he, sent me down to tell you. Father Fattle. Do you know, Jock, sir, I never like to be beholden to any of the clergy. Oh, it's, it's dangerous work, no. If they do anything for you, they want you to be living in the chapel. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something, Jock, sir, that I wouldn't tell to anybody else. The clergy always had too much power over the people in this unfortunate country. You could sing that if you had an heir to it, Jack. Didn't they prevent the people in 47 from seizing the card and they starving? That's right. Didn't they jump Parnell? Didn't they say that hell wasn't hot enough, nor eternity long enough to punish the fiends? Oh. oh, we don't forget. We don't forget them things, Jack, sir. If they've taken everything else from us, Jack, sir, they left us our memory. Our memory's the only friend that a grief can call its own. Mm -hmm. That grief can call its own, Jack. <laughs> Father Faddle is beginning to take a great interest in Captain Boyle because of what Johnny did for his country, says he to me one day. Well, <laughs> it's a curious way to reward Johnny for making his poor old father work. Huh? Well, that's what the clergy want, Jocks. Work, work, work for me and you. Having us mewling from morning till night so that they may be in better fettle when they come hopping round for their Jewess. Uh -huh. <laughs> job. Oh. Well, let him give his job to one of his hymn singing, oh. prayer spouting, crawl thumping comprehensions, he man. Oh. Oh. God be with the young days when you were stepping the deck of a manly ship. With the wind blowing a hurricane through the masts, and the only sound you heard was port your helm, and the only answer port it is, sir. Ah, <laughs> uh, them was days, Jock, sir. Them was days. Nothing was too hot or too heavy for me then. Sailing from the Gulf of Mexico to the Antarctic Ocean. I seen things. I seen things, Jock, sir, that no mortal man should speak about that knows his catechism. Often and often, when I was fixed to the wheel with a marlin spike, and the winds blowing fierce and the waves lashing and lashing, they think every minute was going to be our last. And I blowed and bl blew is the right word, Jack, sir, but blowed is what the sailors use. Ah, it's, a, it's a darling word, a darling word. And as it blowed and blowed, I often looked up at the sky and ask myself the question, what is the stars? What is the stars? Ah, that's the question, Jack. That's the question. What is the stars? And then I'd have another look, yeah. and I'd ask myself, what is the moon? Ah, that's the question, Jack. What is the moon? What? Is it, is it you, no, is it? Do you want any blocks? No, we don't want any blocks. That's after putting the heart across me, Jack. I could have sworn it was Juno. I think I'd better be going. You couldn't tell the minute Juno would hop in on us. Look, let her hop in. We may as well have it out first as last. I've made up me mind. I'm not going to do only what she jam well likes. Now, them sentiments does your credit, Captain. I don't like to say anything as between man and wife, but I say as a butty, as a butty, Captain, that you stuck it too long. And it's about time you showed a little spunk. So how can a man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? Yes. Now, she has her rights. There's no denying it. But haven't I me rights, too? Of course you have, Jack. The sacred rights of man. Now, look, today, Jack, sir, there's going to be issued a proclamation be me, establishing an independent republic. And you and I'll have to take an oath of allegiance. And be firm. Be firm, Captain. The first few minutes will be the worst. If you gently touch a nettle, it'll sting you for your pains. Grasp it like a ladder metal and as soft as silk remains. Can't stop, Mrs. Madigan. I haven't oh, a minute. Holy God, here she is. Hey, quick now, Jocks. Right out through the window and onto the roof. As soon as she's gone, I'll let you know. Oh, you that fella stopped when she was in on top of us? Oh, you're in. You must have been only after coming in. No, I never went out. It's curious, then, you never heard the knocking. Knocking? Of course I heard the knocking. And why didn't you open the door, then? I suppose you were so busy with Joxer that you hadn't time. I haven't seen Joxer since I seen him before. Joxer. 
Oh, well, what a bring jocks are here? Do you mean to tell me that the pair of yous wasn't Cologan together here when me back was torn? What did we be Cologan together about? I'm something else to think of besides Cologan with jocks are. I can swear on all the holy prayer books. That you weren't a no snug. Yeah. Go on in at once now and take off that moleskin trousers of yours and put on a collar and tie to smarten yourself up a bit. There's a visitor coming with Mary in a minute and he has great news for you. Yeah, a job, I suppose. Well, look, let's get one first before we start looking for another. That's the thing that's able to put the win up you. Well, it's no job but news that'll give you the chance of your life. Well, what's all the mystery about? Go in and take off the moleskin trousers when you're told. Oh, God bless us. Look at the way everything's thrown about. Oh, Joxer was here. Joxer was here. Come on in, Chan. Well, thank you, Mary. Ah, come in, Mr. Bentham. How do you do, Mrs. Boyle? Sit down, Mr. Bentham, in this chair. It's more comfortable than that, Mr. Bentham. Himself will be here in a minute. He's just taken off his trousers. Oh, Mother! Well, please don't put yourself to any trouble, Mrs. Boyle. I'm quite all right here, thank you. And to think of you knowing Mary and she knowing the news you had for us and wouldn't let on. But it's all the more welcomer now, for we were on our last lap. You must excuse the state of the place, Mr. Bentham. The minute I tore me back, that man of mine always makes a litter of the place. A litter of the place. Don't worry, Mrs. Boyle. It's all right, I assure you. Where's me braces? Where in the name of God did I leave me braces? Hey, did you see where I put me braces? Oh, ma, will you come in here and say, da, away you at this? Or you'll drive me mad. Dear, 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 that man will be looking for something on the day of judgment. Look at your braces, man, hanging round your neck. Oh, holy God. Johnny, Johnny, come out here for a minute. I'll leave Johnny alone and don't be annoying him. Come on, Johnny, till I introduce you to Mr. Bentham. Me son, Mr. Bentham, he's after going through the mill. He was only a chisel of our boy scout in Easter week when he got hit in the hip and his arm was blew off in the fight in O'Connell Street. Here he is, Mr. Bentham. Mr. Bentham, Johnny. No one can deny he done his bit for Ireland, if that's going to do him any good. I'd do it again, ma. I'd do it again. For principle's a principle. Ah, uh, you lost your best principle when you lost your arm. Them's the only sort of principles that's any good to a working man. Ireland only half free will never be at peace while well, she's a son left to pull a trigger. To be sure, to be sure. No bread's a lot better than half a loaf. Will you hurry up there, Jack? All right, all right, all right. I'm coming, I'm coming. This is me husband, Mr. Boyle, Mr. Bentham. I'm very glad to know you, Mr. Boyle. How are you? Uh, not too well at all. I suffer terrible with pains in me legs. Juno can tell you there what I go through. You won't have many pains in your legs when you hear what Mr. Bentham has to tell you. Juno? What an interesting name. It reminds one of Homer's glorious story of ancient gods and heroes. Yes, doesn't it? Well, you see, Juno was born and christened in June. Ah, Jack, I Mr. met ben her in June, and we were married in June, and Johnny was born in June. So one day I says to her, you should have been called Juno. And the name stuck to her ever since. Here we can talk of them things again. Let Mr. Bentham say what he has to say now. Well, Mr. Boyle, I suppose you'll remember a Mr. Ellison of Sentry. He's a relative of yours, I think. I, is it that prognosticator and procrastinator? Of course I remember him. Well, he's dead, Mr. Boyle. Yeah, well, sort of many will go into mourning for him. Wait till you hear what Mr. Bentham has to say, and then maybe you'll change your opinion. A week before he died, he sent for me to write his will for him. He told me that there were two only that he wished to leave his property to. His second cousin, Michael Finnegan of Santry, and John Boyle, his first cousin of Dublin. That's there you now, Jack. Uh, it's me. Is you, it me? Me. You, Mr. Boyle? Uh -oh. I'll read a copy of the will that I have here with me, which has been duly filed in the Court of Probate. Oh, God. 6th of February, 1922. This is the last will and testament of William Ellison of Santry in the county of Dublin. I hereby order and wish my property to be sold and divided as follows. 20 pounds to the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Yeah. 60 pounds for masses for the repose of my soul, five shillings for each mass. Yeah. The rest of my property to be divided between my first and second cousins. That's you, Dad. 
I hereby appoint Timothy Buckley of Santry and Hugh Brierley of Coolock to be my executors. Signed, William Ellison, Hugh Brierley, Timothy Buckley, Charles Bentham, N.T. <laughs> but how, how much would be coming out of it, Mr. Bentham? Well, the executors told me that half of the property would be anything between... Ooh, 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. It's a fortune, Dad, a fortune. We'll be able to get out of this place now and go somewhere we're not known. You won't have to trouble about a job for a while, Jack. Oh, he'll never doubt the goodness of God again. I congratulate you, Mr. Boyle. Uh, and now, Mr. Bentham, y you'll have to have a wet. Dad. A wet? A wet. A jar. A bowl. Jack, you're speaking to Mr. Bentham and not to Jock, sir. Do you know? Mary? Yes, Dad. Johnny? Yes, yeah. We'll have to go into mourning as once. I never expected that poor Bill would die so sudden. Well, we all have to die someday. You, Juno, today, and me, maybe, tomorrow. It's sad, but it can't be helped. Requiescat in pace. Or using our old tongue like St. Patrick or St. Bridges, Gosseri Gia Area. Oh, Dad, that's not rest and peace. That's. God save Ireland. Yeah. It's all the same, isn't it a prayer? Do you know? I'm done with Joxer. He's nothing but a prognosticator oh, and a pro. Oh no! You're done with Joxer, are you? Maybe you thought I'd stop out in the roof all the night for you. Joxer! Out in the roof with the wind blowing to him was nothing to you. And your friends here with a collar and tie. What in the name of God brought you out on the roof? Ah. What were you doing there? I was dreaming I was standing on the bridge of a ship and she sailing the Antarctic Ocean. And it blowed and it blowed. And me looking up at the sky and saying, What is the stars? What is the stars? Here, go with this Jackson are daily. I was always thinking you had a slate on. Yeah, I have to laugh every time I look at the deep sea sailor and I roar the river and make him seasick. You get out with this now before I take the law into my own hands. Say, oh, you are, but not goodbye. Looking for work. And pray to God he won't get us. I'm tired telling you what Jackson was. Maybe now you see yourself the kind he is. Yeah, well, he, he'll never blow the froth off a pint of mine again. That's a sure thing. Johnny? Yeah. Mary? Yes, Dad. You're to keep yourselves to yourselves for the future. Yes, Dad. Do you know? I'm done with Joxer. I'm a new man from this house. Oh, be darling, you know, I will be true to thee. Me own, me darling, you know, you're all. Come along, Joxery son. Come along. Are you be yourself? Come on, come on. That doesn't matter. I'm master now, and I'm going to remain master. Hey, and Jack, how do you feel now as a man of money? Huh? It's a responsibility, Joxer. A great responsibility. Yeah, I suppose it is now. Though you wouldn't think it. Ever since the will was passed, I run hundreds of documents through me hands. I tell you, you have to keep your wits about you. Ah, well, now, I, I won't disturb you. I, I'll drop in when it's you... All, when it's I... all right, Doctor. This is the last one to be signed today. Yes, that's it. Now, Doctor, you want to see me? Oh, I'm at your service. What can I do for you, me man? Well, I've just dropped in with the three pounds five that Mrs. Madigan brings on the blankets and table for you. And she says you're to be in no hurry paying it back. Oh, she, she won't be long without it. I expect the first cheque for a couple of hundreds any day. Oh. Now, there's the five bob for oh, yourself. Well, now, go Jack, on, Jack, Jack, Jack. take it, man, take it. <laughs> it won't be the last you get from the captain. Now and again, we have our dipper. But we're together all the time. Yeah, oh, me for you and you for me. <laughs> like the two musketeers. Father Fardell stopped me today and told me how glad he was I fell in for the money. Oh, he'll be stopping you often enough now, Jack. I suppose it was uh, Mr. Boyle with him. He shook me by the hand. Oh, I, I met with Napper Tandy and he shook me by the hand. <laughs> now, you, look, you're seldom a stray, Joxer, but you're wrong ship this time. What you're saying of Father Fardell is very near to blasphemy. 
I don't like anyone to talk disrespectful of Father Farley. Ah, well now, look, you're, you're taking me up wrong, Captain. Oh, wouldn't that be a word be said again, Father Farley? The heart of a row, that's what he is. So I always said he was a darling man, a darling man. Yeah, well, c coming up the stairs, who did I meet but that bum or Nugent? Oh. I've seen you talking to Father Farley, says he, with a grin on him. He'll be following you, says he, like a guard's an angel from this house. All the time when the old grin on him, Jock, sir. Oh, sure, I never seen him yet, but he had the same old grin on him. <laughs> Mr. Nugent, says I. Father Farrell is a man of the people. And as far as I know the history of me country, the priest was always in the van of the fight for Ireland's freedom. Ah, that's right, Jack. Who was it led the van? Sagat Since the fight first began, Sagat Who were you telling, says he? Didn't they let down the Fenians? Didn't they do in Parnell? And now, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, says I, interrupting the right. Yeah. Not to know the history of your country, and I let him gawk on where he was. <laughs> <laughs> where ignorance is bliss, tis funny to be wise. I wonder, I wonder, Jack, did he ever read the story of Ireland? P.J. L. Sullivan? Yeah. Uh, don't you know he didn't? Ah, it's a darling book, a darling book. Hey, well, you better be going now, Jock, sir. His Majesty Bentham will be here any minute now. Hey, uh, but the way things is looking, it'll be a match between him and Mary. She's thrown over Jerry altogether. Well, I, I hope it will, because he's a darling man. Well, I'm glad you think so. I don't. Well, what's darling about him? Oh, well, no. <laughs> Jack, I, I only seen him twice. <laughs> if you want to know me, come and live with me. He's too ignified for me. To hear him talk, y you think he knew as much as a bony's oraculum? He's given up his job as a teacher, you know, and he he's going to become a solicitor in Dublin. Oh. He's been studying law. Oh. I suppose he thinks I'll set him up, but he's wrong shipped. Another fella, another fella, Jerry's as bad. Oh. The two of them are giving you a pain in your face, listening to them. Jerry believing in nothing, and Bentham believing in everything. One that says all is God and no man, and other that says all is man and no oh, God. Gosh. <laughs> well, I'd be off now, Jack. But mm. listen, don't forget to drop down after a while. We'll, we'll have a quiet jar and a song uh, or two. Uh, never fair. But never listen, fair. will you tell Mrs. Yeah. Madigan that I hope we'll have the pleasure of our organisation at our little entertainment? Why so, Captain? Why so? We'll come down together. Uh, listen, Johnny. Ah, leave me alone, will you? Open the door, Jack. This thing has me nearly kissed with the waves. Oh, Mary, put these cakes over there and give me a hand with the gramophone. Carrying that from Henry Steve was no joke. Oh, that, that's a grand looking instrument. How much was it? Pound down and five to be paid at two shillings a week. Well, that's reasonable enough. I'm afraid we're running into too much debt. Forced the furniture, and now this. Yeah, the whole lot won't be much out of two thousand pounds. I don't know what you wanted with the gramophone. I know Charlie hates them. He says they're destructive of real music. Destructive of music? Well, that fella give you pain in your face. All a gramophone wants is to be properly played. It's through one that is only felt when everything's quiet. What a gramophone wants is dead silence. But Dad, uh, Jerry says the same, and after all, you can only appreciate music when your ear is properly trained. Now, that's another fella I give you a pain in your face. Properly trained. I suppose you couldn't appreciate football unless your foot was properly trained. Oh, Mary, go on in our damn dress, or Charlie being on you, and tea and our nothing will be ready. All right, ma'am. You didn't look at our new gramophone, Johnny. Mm. It isn't gramophones I'm thinking of. And what is it you're thinking of, Alana? Nothing. Nothing, nothing. Sure, you must be thinking of something. It's yourself that has yourself the way you are. Sleeping one night in me sisters, and the next in your father's brothers. They'll get no rest going on that way. Oh, I can rest nowhere. Nowhere, nowhere. Sure, you're not trying to rest anywhere. Oh, let me alone, let me alone, let me alone, for God's sake. Oh, here he is, here's Mr. Bentham. Yeah, well, there's room for him. It's a pity you now there's not a brass band to play him in. We'll hand the tea round and I'll be clustered around the table as if we never see nothing. I'll open the door for him. Ah, oh, Mr. Bentham, 
Come in, give your hat and stick to Jack there. Hat and stick. Sit down, Mr. Bantam, in this chair by the fire. Thank Mary will be out to you in a minute. Hey, I, I seen be the paper this morning that consoles was down half percent. That's, that's serious, mind you. And shows the whole country's in a state of chassis. What's consoles, Jack? Consoles? Uh, consoles is, uh... Uh, oh, there's no use telling women what consoles is. They wouldn't understand. It's just as you were saying, Mr. Boyle. Hello, Charlie. Oh, good evening, Mary. Well, how pretty you're looking. Am I? We were just yes. saying when you came in, Mary, I was telling Mr. Benton that the whole country's in a state of chassis. Would you prefer the green or the blue ribbon round my hair, Charlie? Mary, well, our father speaking. I was just telling Mr. Benton that the whole country's in a state of chassis. And I'm sure you're fretting, Dad. With all our churches and religions, the world's not a bit the better. Here, tea. And Ireland's taken a leaf out of the world's book. When we got the making of our own laws, leave it down there, Mary, I thought we'd never stop to look behind us, but instead of that, we never stopped to look before us. Yes, the jam here, Mary. If the people had folly up their religion better, there'd be a better chance for us. What do you think, Mr. Bentham? Well, I'm afraid I can't venture to express an opinion on that point, Mrs. Boyle. Dogma has no attraction for me. I forgot you didn't hold with us. What's this you said you were? A, a theosophist, Mrs. Boyle. And what in the name of God's a theosophist? A, a theosophist, do you know, is a, 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 a... Tell her, Mr. Bentham, you tell her. Well, it's hard to explain in a few words. Theosophy is founded on the Vedas, the religious books of the East. Its central theme is the existence of an all-pervading spirit, the life breath. Nothing really exists but this one universal life breath. Go away. And whatever even seems to exist separately from this life breath doesn't really exist at all. Mm. It's all vital force in man, in all animals, and in all vegetation. This life breath is called the prana. The prana? What a comical name. Prana. Yes, the prana. That's the prana. Whisht, whisht, Jack. The happiness of man depends upon his sympathy with this spirit. Men who have reached a high state of excellence are called yogi. Mm -hmm. Some men become yogi in a short time. It may take others millions of years. Yogi. You know, I've seen hundreds of them in the streets of San Francisco. It's said by these yogi that if we practice certain mental exercises, that we'd have powers denied to others. For instance, the faculty of seeing things that happen miles and miles away. I wouldn't care to meddle with that sort of belief. It's a very curious religion altogether. And what's curious about it? Isn't all religions curious? Sure, if there weren't, you wouldn't get anyone to believe in them. Ah, but your religions is passing away. They've had their day like everything else. Take the real Dublin people, for instance. They know more about Charlie Chaplin and Tommy Mix than they do about S.S. Peter and Paul. You don't believe in ghosts, Mr. Bentham? Sure, you know he doesn't, Mother. Oh, I don't know about that, Mary. Scientists are beginning to think that what we call ghosts are sometimes seen by persons of a certain nature. They say that sensational actions, such as the killing of a person, demands great energy, and that that energy lingers in the place where the action occurred. Mm. People may live in the place and see nothing, when someone may come along whose personality has some peculiar connection with the energy of the place, and in a flash, the person sees the whole affair. Well, what sort of talk is this to be going on with? Huh? It's nothing better to be talking about with the killing of people. My God, isn't it bad enough for these things to happen without talking about them? I, I'm very sorry, Mrs. Boyle. I never thought... <sighs> never mind, Mr. Bantam. He's very touchy. Oh, no! A mother of God, what's that? Shut the door! Shut the door, quick, for God's sake! God have mercy on me. Blessed Mother of God, shelter me. Shelter your son. What's wrong with you? What ails you? Sit down. Sit down here on the bed. There now, there now. What ails you, Johnny? We've seen him. We've seen him kneeling in front of the statue. Oh, merciful Jesus, have pity on me. Get him a little whiskey. Quick, man, and don't stand gawking. Sit here. Sit here, Mother, between me and the door. I'll sit beside you as long as you like. Only tell me what was it came across you at all. I've seen him. I've seen Robbie Taggart kneeling down before the statue and the red light shining on him. When I went in, he turned and looked at me. I've seen the wounds beating in his breast. Why did he look at me like that? 
It wasn't my fault that he was done in. Oh, Mother of God, keep him away from me. There, there, child, you've imagined it all. There was nothing there at all. It was the red light you seen, and the talk we had put all the rest into your head. Here, drink more of this. It'll do you good. And now stretch yourself down on the bed for a little. Go in, Jack, and show him it was only in his own head this was. Yes, it's all nonsense. It was only a shadow he saw. Father of God, he made my heart leap. Oh, it was simply due to an overwrought imagination. We all get that way at times. There, dear, lie down in the bed and I'll put the quilt across you. Now that's it. You'll be as right as the mail in a few minutes. Mother, go into the room and see if the light's lighting before the statue. Jack, run in and see if the light's lighting before the statue. Uh, Mary, slip in and see if the light's lighting before the statue. It's all right, Mary. I'll go. Everything's just as it was. The light burning bravely before the statue. Yeah, sure, of course. I, I knew it was all nonsense. See who was knocking, Jack. Come on in, Mrs. Madigan. Come on in, Jock, sir. I was afraid you weren't coming. Hey, hey, there's some people able to dress. What, Jock, sir? Ah, fair as the blossoms of bloom in the May, and sweet as the scent of the new moon, eh? Hey. Ah, well, well, may she wear Oh, now I know it's somewhere as sweet as the blossoms of bloom in the May. Oh, no names, no pack thrill. And now I'll introduce the pair of to Mary's intended. Yeah. Mr. Bentham, this is Mrs. Madigan. An old back parlour neighbour that if she could help it at all, it'd never see a body <laughs> shook. I'm sure it's a great pleasure to know you, Mrs. Madigan. And I'm going to tell you, Mr. Bantam, you're going to get as nice a bit of skirt in Mary there as ever you've seen in your pub. Ah. Not like some of the dressed-up dogs that's knocking around now looking for men when it's a good scalp on the want. <laughs> I remember as well as I remember yesterday, the day she was born, of a Tuesday, the 25th of June in the year 1901, at 23 minutes past one of the day, Baby Foley's clock. That's the pub at the corner of the street. And I remember saying to Jacks out there, who I met coming up the stairs, yeah. that the new arrival in Boyles would be a hardy chiseler if she lived, and that she'd be something one of these days that none of us suspected. And so, signs on it, here she is today, going to be married to a young man that looks as if he'd be fit to commensurate in any position in life it had pleased God to call him. Uh, and... Hey, sit down, sit uh, down, Mrs. Uh, Madigan, my <laughs> old boy. Uh, this here is Jocks or Daly, <laughs> past chief ranger of the dear little shamrock branch of the Irish National Foresters, yeah. an old front top neighbour who never despaired, even in the darkest days of oil and sorrow. Uh oh, nil desperandum, Jack, nil desperandum. Sit down, sit down, Jack, yeah, sit down. Yeah. The two of us was open in a tight corner. I and Foley Snow. And we came out of a flying. We came out of a flying, Captain. <laughs> and now, Frederick, I know you just won't refuse an old friend. Is this Johnny not well, Mrs. Barr? Ah, oh, the poor dad. God. Well, God. Mrs. Madigan, is it tea or what? Well, uh, speaking for myself, I just had my tea a few minutes ago, and I'm afraid to drink any more. I'm never the same when I drink too much tea. Thanks all the same, Mr. Vaughan. Well, what, what about a, a bottle of stout or a drop of whiskey? Ah, uh, a bottle of stout would lie a bit heavy on me stomach after me tea. Ah, sure, I'll try the ball of malt. There's nothing like a ball of malt occasional like. Of course, too much of it isn't good for you. Oh, God, Johnny, don't put too much water in us. Well, I suppose you'll be late on this place. I'm looking for a place near the sea. I'd like the place that you might say was me cradle to be me grave as well. The sea is always calling me. Ah, she's calling, calling, calling in the wind and on the sea. Another drop of whiskey, Mrs. Maddie. Well, now it'd be hard to refuse, seeing the suspicious times that's in us. <laughs> <laughs> now, right now, Sam, Juno, Mary, home to our mountain. Here, 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 oh, yeah, here. No, here. Oh, darling song, oh, oh, darling song. I know time, not in a singing you oh, were. Oh. Along with your child and you only going to be married. I remember as well as I remember yesterday. It was on a lovely August evening, exactly according to date 15 years ago, come the Tuesday, following the next one that's coming on now, when me old man, the Lord be good to him, and me, was sitting shy together in a dunky little nook on a country road adjacent to the stiles. Oh, that'll scratch your lovely little white neck. 
clusters, hey? <laughs> Catching hold of a dangling bramble branch holding clusters of the loveliest flowers you ever see. Him. I'm breaking it off so that his arm fell accidentally like round me waist. Oh. <laughs> and as I felt it tighten and on tighten and on tighten, and I thought every minute me bosom was going to burst forth into a rousing song about the little green leaves that are shaking the trees, the gallivant butterflies and humming of the bees. <laughs> are the are the uh, song? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, Mary, and we'll do our best. <coughs> Home to our mountains, let us return, <coughs> love. There in the young days, peace had its reign. There shall thy sweet song fall on my slumbers. There shall thy lute make me joyous again. Rest thee, my mother, kneeling beside me. I shall pour forth my troubadour lay. Away, away, sorrow away, 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 sorrow away. Lull me to rest, lull me to rest. Guys, I, I, darling, Do you know I've never seen you in Batafur? Very nicely rendered indeed. A noble call, though. A noble call. What about yourself, Mrs. Ah, oh, no, 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 I can't no, 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 my true love sails in, and on the top of rigging, I there build my nest. And at night I would sleep on my overlays, white. Happy voices. Though I remember the time when yeah. Maisie Madigan could sing like a nightingale at mating time. I remember as well as I remember yesterday at a party given to celebrate the coming of the first chiseler to Annie and Benny Jimison, who was the Barbie, as may remember, in Henrietta Street, that after Easter week hung out a green, white, and orange pole, and then when the tan started their jazz dancing, whipped it in again and stuck out a red, white, and blue one instead given us an excuse that a barber's pole was strictly non-political. Yeah. <laughs> I remember singing, you'll remember me, with the top notes quivering in a dead hush of petrified attention, followed by a clap and a hands that shook the very tumblers on the table, and capped be Jimison the barber, saying it was the best rendered of you'll remember me he ever heard in his natural. Yeah. In order, yeah. in order for Jux, I saw. I know, ah, yeah. I know what you're saying. Come on. Go on, Jux, I saw. Come on, give us one of your shots. 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 Young hero sleeps, and lovers are round her, are sighing, and lovers are round her, are sighing. What's the use of you trying to sing the song if you don't know it? Try another one, Mr. Daly. Maybe you'd be more fortunate. Yeah, go on, Jackson. Try another song. You know something else. Go on. Get something else. Play the hands I love beside the shally Where, where, where are you? Where are 
you now. Huh? I'll put on the grammar phone for God's oh, sake and I... stop jokes and balling. I hate to see fellas trying to do what they're not able to do. Chris, Jack, don't put us on. Don't put us on yet. This must be poor Mrs. Tanker coming down to go to the hospital. I forgot all about them bringing the body to the church tonight. Open the door, Mary, and give them a bit of light. Come on, now. It's a sad journey we're going on, but God's good, and the Republicans won't always be down. Well, what good is that to me now, whether they're up or down? It won't bring me, darling boy, back from the grave. Come in and have a hot cup of tea, Mrs. Tanker, before you go. Ah, no, thank you, Mrs. Boyle. I can't take anything. I won't be long after him. Still and all, he died a noble death, and we'll bury him like a king. Aye, and I'll go on living like a pauper. Ah, watch the pains I suffered, bringing him into the world to carry him to his cradle, to the pains I'm suffering now, carrying him out of the world to bring him to his grave. It'd be better for you not to go at all, Mrs. Tancred, but to stay at home beside the fire with some of the neighbours. Aye, I seen the first of them. Sure, I'll see the last of them. You'd want a shawl, Mrs. Tancred. It's a cold night and the wind's blowing, Shaw. Look, I've a shawl above. I'll get it for you now, Mrs. Tancred. Me home is gone now. He was me only child. And to think that he was lying for a whole night, stretched out on the side of a lonely country lane, with his head, his darling head, that I often kissed and fondled, half hidden in the water of a running brook. And they tell me that he was the leader of the ambush when me next door neighbour, Mrs. Mannon, lost our free state soldier son. And now, here's the two of us owl women, standing one each side of his scales of sorrow. Balanced be the bodies of our two dead, darling sons. There, no, Mrs. Tanker, put that shawl round your shoulder. Oh, God enough. bless you, Mrs. Madigan. Oh, Mother of God. Mother of God, have pity on the pair of us. Oh, Blessed Virgin, where were you when me darling son was riddled with bullets? When me darling son was riddled with bullets? Oh, sacred heart of the crucified Jesus, take away our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh. Take away this mirth and hate and give us thine own eternal love. Oh, oh, come on, oh, Mrs. Tank, which is the will of God. That was Mrs. Tancred of the two pair back, Mr. Bentham. Her son was found there yesterday, lying out beyond Finglas, riddled with bullets. A die hard, he was by all accounts. He was a nice, quiet boy, but latterly he went to hell, with his republic first and republic last and republic overall. He often took tea with us here in the old days. And Johnny there and him used to be always together. And we always to be having to tell you that he was no friend of mine. I never cared for him, and he could never stick me. It's not because he was commandant of the battalion that I was quartermaster of that we were friends. He's gone now. The Lord be good to him. God help his poor old creature of a mother. For no matter whose friend or enemy he was, he was her poor son. The whole thing is terrible, Mrs. Boyle. But the only way to deal with a mad dog is to destroy him. And to think of me forgetting about him being brought to the church tonight, and we singing and all. Well, was where we hadn't a gramophone going anyhow. Well, even if we had a self, we'd nothing to do with these things one way or the other. That's the government's business. And let them do what we're paying them for doing. I'd like to know how a body's not to mind these things. Look at the way they're after leaving people in this house. Hasn't the whole house nearly been massacred? There's young Doherty's husband with his leg off. Mrs. Travers that had her son blew up be a mining in Shigil in County Cork. Mrs. Mannon that lost one of her sons in an ambush a few weeks ago. And now poor Mrs. Tancred's only child gone west with his body made a colander of. Sure, if it's not our business, I don't know whose business it is. I hear that that's enough about them things. They don't affect us and we needn't give a damn. If they want to wake, well, let them have a wake. When I was a sailor, I was always resigned to meet with a watery grave. 
And if they want to be soldiers, well, there's no use of them squealing when they meet a soldier's face. Yeah, that's right, Jack, that's right. Let me like a soldier fall, make me breast expand to the ball. In one way, she deserves all she got, for lately, she let the joy herds make an open house of the place. And for the last couple of months, either when the sun was rising or when the sun was setting, you had CID men bursting into your room, asking where were you born, where were you christened, where were you married and where would you be buried? Oh, for God's sake, let's have no more of this talk. What about Mr Boyle's song now before we start the gramophone? Mother, Charlie and I are going out for a little stroll. Uh, all right, darling. We won't be long away, Mrs Boyle. Go on, Captain, now, go on. Uh, you, uh, uh, you want to have a few more jars of me before I'd be infected by singing? Hey, well, Jack, Jack, hey, give us that poem you read the other day. Oh, God, it's a darling poem. Oh, it's a darling poem. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Sean and I were friends, sir. Yeah. To me, he was all in all. His work was very heavy, and his wages were very small. None better on the beach. Ah, and... you're going to put on the gramophone tonight, or are you not? Grand, grand, Jack. God, you should follow that up. You should follow that up now. Go on, Jack. Put on a record. Yeah. Well... You shall want to keep a dead silence. I was going to have that thing ballin' and the funeral of Mrs. Tankard's son passing the house. Oh, have none of you any respect yeah. for the Irish people's national regard for the dead? Maybe, Needle Nugent, it's nearly time we had a little less respect for the dead and a little more regard for the living. We don't want you, Mr. Nugent, to teach us what we learnt at our mother's knee. You don't look at yourself as if you are dying of grief. If you ask me, D. Madiganatton, I call you a real true die haired and live soft Republican at ten Republican funerals in the day and stopping up half the night making suits for the civic guards. Here's the hairs, here's the hairs. There's the old mother walking behind the coffin. You can hardly see the coffin with the reeds and the flowers. Ah, it's a darling funeral. A darling funeral. Hey, look, we'd have a better view from the street. Come Is on, Joe. Are you going to leave me all alone here? Quartermaster Boyle. The mobilizer. You're not at the funeral. I'm not well. I'm glad I found you. You were stopping at your aunt's. I called there, but you'd gone. I've to give you an order to attend a battalion staff meeting the night after tomorrow. Where? I don't know. You're to meet me at the pillars eight o'clock. Then we're to go to a place I'll be told of tonight. There we'll meet a motor that'll bring us to the meeting. They think you might be able to know something about them that gave the bend where Commandant Tancred was sheltering. I'm not going, that. I know nothing about Tancred. You better come for your own sake. Remember your oath. I won't go. Haven't I done enough for Ireland? I've lost me arm and me hips destroyed so that I'll never be able to walk right again. Good God, haven't I done enough for Ireland? Boyle, no man can do enough for Ireland. And has Bentham never even written to you since? Not one line for the past month? No, not even a line, Mother. That's very curious. What came between the two yous at all? To leave you so sudden and you so great together? To go away to England and not even leave you his address? The way he was always bringing you to dances, I thought he was mad after you. Are you sure you said nothing to him? No. Well, at least nothing that could possibly explain has given me up. I know you're a bit hasty at times, Mary, and say things you shouldn't say. Well, I never said to him what I shouldn't say. I'm sure of that. How are you sure of this? Because I... I love him, Mother. Why, I don't know. I often thought to myself that he wasn't the man poor Jerry was, but I couldn't help loving him all the same. But you shouldn't be fretting the way you are. When a woman loses a man, she never knows what she's after losing, to be sure, but then she never knows what she's after gaining, either. You were not the one girl of a month ago. You look like one pining away. It's long ago I had a right to bring you to the doctor instead of waiting till tonight. Oh, there's no necessity, really, Mother, to go to the doctor. See, there's nothing serious wrong with me. I, I'm run down and disappointed, that's all. I'll not wait another minute. I don't like the look of you at all. 
But I'm afraid we made a mistake in throwing over poor Jerry. He'd have been better for you than that, Bentham. Mother, the best man for a woman is the one she has the most love for. And Charlie had it all. Well, there's one thing to be said for him. He couldn't have been thinking of the money or he wouldn't have left you. It must have been something else. I don't know. I don't know, Mother. Only I, I think that... What do you think? Well, I imagine he thought... We weren't good enough for him. And what was he himself, only a school teacher? Though I don't blame him for fighting shy of people like that jocks or fell in that old Madigan one. Nice sort of people for your father to introduce to a man like Mr. Bentham. You might have told me all about this before now, Mary. I don't know why you like to hide everything from your mother. You knew Bentham and I'd have known nothing about it if it hadn't been for the will. And was only today, after long coaxing, that you let out that he'd left you. Sure, it'd have been useless to tell you. Sure, you wouldn't have understood. Maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't understand. Well, we'll be off now. We are going out to the doctors. Are you going to get up this evening? Oh, the pains of me legs is terrible. It's me should be popping off to the doctor instead of Mary, the way I feel. Sarah mend you. A nice way you were in last night, carried in in a frog's mash, dead to the world. If that's the way you'll go on when you get the money, it'll be the grave for you and asylum for me and the poor house for Johnny. I thought you were going. That's what has you as you are. You can't bear to be spoken to. Knowing the way we are, up to our ears in debt, it's a wonder you wouldn't have got up to the solicitors. And see if we could have gotten a little of the money, even. I can't be going up there night, noon, and morning, can I? He can't give me the money till he gets it, can he? I can't get blood out of a turnip, can it's I? It's nearly two months since we heard of the will, and the money seems as far off as ever. I suppose you know we owe 20 pounds to old Morphy. I've a faint recollection of you telling me that before. Well, you'll go over to the shop yourself for the things in future. I'll face him no more. I thought you said you were going. I'm going now. Come on, Mary. Hey, Juno, hey. Ma, what do you want now? Is there ere a bottle of stout left? There's two of them here still. Well, show us in one of them and leave the other day clutches up. And throw us in the paper that's on the table and the bottle of liniment that's in the drawer. What paper is it you want? The Catholic Herald. The Catholic Herald. The news of the world. Mind the candle now there. And don't burn the house over our heads. I left the other bottle of stews here in the centre of the table. Come on, Mary. God, they must be all out. I was thinking there was something up when he didn't answer the signal. We seen Juno and Mary go, but I didn't see him. It's very seldom he escapes me. Well, he's not going to escape me. He's not going to be let go to the fair altogether. Uh, should the house couldn't hold him lately? And he going about like a masterpiece of the free state country, forgetting our friends, forgetting God. I wouldn't even lift his hat past in the chapel, should they were bound to get a drop. I, and neither. Hmm? You really think there's no money coming to him after all? Not as much as a red rex, man. Oh. You know, I've been a bit anxious this long time over me money, and I went up to the solicitors to find out all I could. Oh, man, they were going to throw me down the stairs. Oh. They told me that they would cock himself, had the stairs worn away coming up after it, and they black in the face telling him he'd get nothing. Some way or another that the will is writ, he won't be entitled to get as much as a make. Yeah, I thought there was something curious about the whole thing. I've been having strange dreams for the last couple of weeks, and I noticed that Bentham fella doesn't be coming here now. It must be something on the mat there, too, hmm? Anyhow, who in the name of God would leave anything to that old bummer? Should, should it be unnatural? 
And the way June on him's been torn the waiter bill for the last few months. Ah, him that goes a borrowing, goes a sorrowing. Well, he's not going to throw his ways about in the suits I made for a much longer. I'm telling you, seven pounds aren't to be found growing on the bushes these days. And there isn't hardly a neighbour in the whole street that hasn't lent him money on the strength of what he was going to get. <laughs> but they're after backing the wrong horse. Hey, Needler. Hmm? Wasn't well, it the mercy of God I'd nothing to give him? Yeah, a softy I am, you know. I'd have lent him me last use. Must have had somebody's good prayers. Ah, well, after all, an honest man's the noblest work of God. <coughs> Whisper, hey, damn it. Damn it, he must, must be inside in the bed. No, inside the bed or outside of it. He's going to pay me for that suit. I'll give it back. <laughs> He'll not climb up my back as easily as he thinks. Go on in at once, Mac. Go on in. Get it off him. Don't be a fool. <coughs> oh, um... Don't disturb yourself, Mr. Boyle. I, I hope you're not sick. Uh, it's no legs, Mr. Nugent. No legs. Yes, well, I just called over now to see if you could let me have Anton off the suit. Yeah, well, uh, how much is this a chase? No, it's the same as it was at the start. Seven pounds. Uh, mm, well, I'm glad you can, Mr. Nugent. I want a good, heavy top coat. Mm. Irish fries, do you have it? <sighs> How much would a top coat like that be now? About uh, six pounds. Six pounds? Six and seven. Six and seven is thirteen. Well, that'll be thirteen pounds, I know. Yeah. <coughs> you low me no thirteen pounds. Maybe you think you're better able to hold than pay us. <laughs> Come on, you <laughs> hell of a dash. Where are you going with them clothes of mine? Where am I going with them clothes of yours? <laughs> well, I'd like your damn cheeks. Hey, here, what am I going to dress myself in when I'm going out? You can put yourself in a bullstock cover if you like. <laughs> What'll he dress himself up in? Gentleman Jack and his fries coat. Hey, you, you, <laughs> Mr. Nugent, Mr. Nugent. What's up? What's wrong, Captain? Nugent ought to be in here to took away me suit. The only thing I had to go out in. Took away your suit? For God's sake. And what were you doing while he was taking them? I was in bed when he stole in, like a thief in the night, and before I knew even what he was taking them, he whipped them off the chair and he was off like a red shank. Well, what in the name of God did he do that for? What did he do it for? Yeah. How the hell do I know what he'd done it for? Jealousy and spite, I suppose. Uh, did he not say what he'd done it for? I'm a day after telling you that he had them whipped up and he was gone before I could open me mouth. Ah, oh, that was a very sudden thing to do, Jack. Must have been something behind it. Did he, uh, did he hear Anton, no wonder? Did he hear Anton? You talk very queer, Jack, sir. What could he hear? Well, uh, about you, uh, not getting the money. In some way or other, huh? And what did prevent me from getting the money? Well, that's just what I was thinking, Jack. Just what I was thinking. What'd prevent you getting the money? Nothing, as far as I can see. Oh, holy God. Well, what, what's up, Jack? He must have after lipped in the bottle of stout that you know left on the table. Oh, no. I, I wouldn't be after doing a thing like that. And who done it, then? Huh? Do you know left a bottle of stout there and it's gone? It didn't walk away, did it? God, that's shocking. Shocking, Jack. Oh, man's inhumanity to man. Makes countless thousands more. I hope I'm not disturbed when you're in any discussion on your forthcoming legacy, if I may use the word. And did you let me have a barney for a minute or two, did you, Mr. Boyle? <laughs> to be sure, Mrs. Madigan, you're an old friend's always welcome. Come in the evening, come in the morning, come when you're asked, or come without warning, Mrs. Madigan. It's, sit down, Mrs. Madigan. A few words I have to say can be said stunting. Putting aside all formularies, I suppose you remember me lending you some time ago three pounds that I raised on blankets and furniture in me uncle's. You say, I remember it well. I have it recorded in me book. Let me, let me see now. Oh. Right. Three pounds, five shillings from Maisie Madigan raised on articles pawned. And item, fourpence, given to make up the price of a pint on the principle that no board ever flew on one wing. All to be repaid at par when the ship comes home. Well, ever since I shoved in the blankets, I've been perishing with the cold. And I've decided, if I'm going to be too hot in the next world itself, I'm not going to be too cold in this world. And consequently, I want me three pounds, if you please. Well, this is a very sudden demand, Mrs. Madigan, and can't be met. 
Well, I'm willing to give you a receipt in full. Come in on, full. come on, out of the money and don't be jack acting. Look, you can't get blood out of a turnip. Give me you? money, you reprobate, or I'll, I'll shake the worth of it out of you. Hey, hold on there, hold on. Oh. You'll wait for your money now, me lassie. What? I'll wait for it? Will I? Well, I'll not wait long. If I can't get the cash, I'll get the worth of it anyway. Hey, 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 where are you going with that gramophone? I'm going to the pawn to get me three quid, five shillings. I'll bring you the ticket, and then you can do what you like, me book. Look, you can't touch that. You can't touch that. It's not my property, and it's not paid by but yet. But so much the better. It'll be an ease to me conscience anyway, for I'm taking what doesn't belong to you. You're not going to be swanking it like a peacock with Maisie Madigan's money. I'll pull some of the gorgeous feathers out of your tail, me book off. What's the world coming to, Tom? I ask you, Jack Tridelli, is there any morality left anywhere? I wouldn't have believed it, Jack. Only I've seen it with my own two eyes. I, I, I didn't think Maisie Madigan was that sort of a woman. She's either a subtaken or uh, maybe she's heard something. Heard something? Yeah. About what, if it's not any harm to ask you? Uh, she, she must have heard some rumour that you weren't going to get the money. And who says I'm not going to get the money? I know, I know, Jack. I was only saying. Only saying what? Nothing. You are going to say something. Don't be a twister. Hey, who's a twister? Why well, don't you speak your mind? You then. never twisted yourself, man. Ah, oh, you wouldn't know how. Did you ever know me to twist? Did you ever know me to twist? Did you ever do anything else? You can't believe a word that comes out of your mouth. Here, get out of this. Huh? I always you. You were a prognosticator and a procrastinator. Oh, the anchor's wait. Farewell, remember me. Jackie Boyle, Esquire, Infernal Rogue and Damned Lawyer. Where'd you help? Jock's on you at it again. And you're going to have a little respect for yourself and not be always making a show of us all. Yeah, are you going to lecture me now? Yeah. Uh, mother back from the doctor yet with Mary. Uh, here she is now. Well, what did the doctor say about Mary? Sit down there, Jack. I have something to say to you about Mary. About Mary. More trouble in our native land. Well, what is it? It's about Mary. Well, what about Mary? There's nothing wrong with her, is there? I'm sorry to say there's a gradle wrong with her. A gradle wrong with her? First, Johnny, now Mary, is the whole house going to become an hospital? It's not consumption, is it? No, it's not consumption. It's worse. Worse? Well, we'll have to get her into some place out of this. There's no one here to mind her. We'll all have to mind her now. You might as well know now, Johnny, as another time. Do you know what the doctor said to me about her, Jack? How would I know? I wasn't there, was I? He told me to get her married at once. Married at once? Oh, my God, what did Bentham say when he hears that? Are oh, you blind man that you can't see that was Bentham that has done this wrong to her? Huh? Well, then he'll marry her. He'll have to marry her. You know he's gone to England, and God knows where he is now. Well, I'll follow him. I'll follow him and bring him back and make him do more justice. The scoundrel. I might have known what he was with his yogis and his prana. We'll have to keep it quiet till we can see what we can do. Oh, isn't this a nice thing to come on top of me and the state I'm in? Oh, I'm pretty sure I'll be the joxer into that old one Madigan. And would I have to go through a nook without having to go through this? What you and I'll have to go through will be nothing to what poor Mary'll have to go through. For you and me is middling old and most of our years is spent. But Mary will have maybe 40 years to face and handle. And every one of them will be tainted with a bitter memory. Where is she? Where is she? Like, tell her off. I'm telling you, when I'm done with her, she'll be a sorry girl. I left her and my sisters till I came to speak to you. You'll say nothing to her, Jack. Ever since she left school, she's earned her living. And your fatherly care never troubled the poor girl. Go on. Take her part again, her father. But I'll let you see whether I'll say nothing to her or no. Hoarding or reading. That's more of the blasted nonsense that has the house falling down on top of us. What do the likes of her born in a tenement house want with reading? Her reading's apt to bring her to a nice pass. Oh, it's maddening. Maddening, maddening. When she comes back, say nothing to her, Jack, or she'll leave this place. Leave this place? <laughs> yeah, she'll leave this place and quit too. If Mary goes, I'll go with her. I'll go with her? Go the perious. I lived before I seen yous, but I can live when yous are gone. Isn't this a nice thing to come rolling in on top of me? And it'll be better to all over the district before you can say Jack Robinson. And whenever I'm seeing then whisper, that's the father of Mary Boyle that had the kid be the swank she used to go with, do you know? Do you know? To be sure they'll know. 
more about it than I will myself. She shall be driven out of the house she's brought disgrace on. Hush you, Johnny. We needn't let it be bellest all over the place. All we've got to do is to leave this place quietly and go somewhere where we're not known and nobody'll be the wiser. You're talking like a two-year-old woman. Where'll we get a place out of this? Places aren't that easy, got. But, Jack, when we get the money... Money? What money? Why, old Ellison's money, of course. There's no money coming from old Ellison or anyone else. Since you heard of one trouble, you might as well hear of another. There's no money coming to us at all. The will's a washout. What are you saying, man? No money. How could it be a washout? The boy who deserved the doing it to Mary, he done it to me as well. The tick made out the will wrong. He said in the will only first cousin and second cousin, instead of mentioning our names. And now anyone that thinks he's a first cousin or second cousin to Owl Ellison can claim the money as well as me. And they're springing up in hundreds. Come up from America and Australia thinking to get the whack out of it. While all the time the lawyers is gobbling it up. Till there's not as much as a boy of stocking for your lovely daughter's baby. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Why did you say nothing about this before? You're not serious, Jack. You're not serious. I'm telling you the scholar Bentham made a banjax of the will. Instead of saying... The rest of me property to be divided between me first cousin Jack Boyle and me second cousin Mick Finnegan of Santry, he writ down only me first and second cousins. And the world and his wife are after the property now. Now I know why Bentham left poor Mary in the lurch. I can see it all now. Oh, is there not even a middling honest man left in the world? And you let us run into debt and borrowed money from everybody to fill yourself with beer. Now you tell us the whole thing's a washout. Or if it's true, I'm done with you. For you're worse than me, Sister Mary. You hold your tongue, do you hear? I'll not take any lip from you. Go and get Bentham if you want satisfaction for all this after happening. I won't hold me tongue. I won't hold me tongue. I'll tell you what I think of your father and knowledge you are. You... Johnny, 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 for God's sake, be quiet. He's not be quiet. I'll not be quiet. He's a nice father, isn't he? Is it any wonder Mary went astray when he... Johnny, go Johnny, for my sake be quiet, for your mother's sake. I'm going out now to have a few drinks with the last few mates I have. And tell that lassie of yours not to be here when I come back. For if I lay me eyes on her, I lay me hands on her. And if I lay me hands on her, I won't be accountable for me actions. I'll take care somebody doesn't lay his hands on you, you... Johnny, Johnny. <laughs> a nice son... And a nicer daughter I have. Chuck, sir. Chuck, sir, are you there? Uh, oh, I'm here, Maria. I'm going down to Foley's. Are you coming? Who is you? Ah, oh, with that sweet Connie artist, George. I'm only waiting for the word, and I'll be with you like a board. I have a nice sister and a nice father. There's no betting on it. Wish to God a bullet or a bomb had whipped me out of this long ago. No one he is. No one he is of any thought for me. If you don't wish, Johnny, you'll drive me mad. Who has kept the home together for the past few years? Only me. And who'll have to bear the biggest part of this trouble but me? But whining and whinging isn't going to do any good. You're to blame yourself for a great lover. Giving him his own way and everything and never asking to check him, no matter what he done. Why didn't you look after the money? What? Who's this now? We've been sent up by the manager of the Hibernian Furnishing Company, Mrs. Boyle, to take back the furniture that we got a while ago. You'll touch nothing here. How do I know who you are? Well, there's they are, the ma'am. A chest of drawers, a table, one easy and two ordinary chairs, one mirror, one chest of field divan, and a wardrobe vase. Come on, Bill. It's after knocking off time already. Right, we'll sir. Chest of drawers first. God's sake, Mother, run down to Foley's and bring Father back, or we'll be left without a sting. What good would it be? You heard what he said before he went out. Can't you try? He ought to be here in the look of this going on. All right, Johnny, all right. What's up, Mother? And that man carrying away the chest of drawers, and everybody's talking about us not getting the money after all. Everything's gone wrong, Mary. We're not getting a penny out of the will, not a penny. I'll tell you all when I come back. I'm going to look for your father. It's a wonder you're not ashamed to show your face here after what's happened. May 
Mary, I want to speak to you for a few moments. May I? Your, your mother's told me everything, Mary, and I've come to you... I've come to tell you that my love for you is greater and deeper than ever. Jerry. Jerry, don't say that. All that's over now, sure. Anything like that is... It's impossible now. Possible? Why do you talk like that, Mary? Well, after all that's happened, I... I sure, what does it matter what's happened? We're young enough to be able to forget all those things. I want to forget Bentham. I want to forget that you left me even for a while. Oh, Jerry. Jerry, you, you haven't the bitter word of scorn for me after all. Scorn? I love you. I love you, Mary. Even though... Even though you did throw me over for another man. Even though you gave me many a bitter word. Oh, I know, but, but you mean... You mean you love me even... Even though I'm... You know, I'm going to have... What? I was thinking, you don't know everything. Surely to God, Mary, you don't mean that... You... Now you know it all, Jerry. Now you know. My God, Mary, have you fallen as low as that? Yes, Jerry, as you say, I've fallen as low as that. Oh, I, I, I didn't mean it that way, Mary. It came with so sudden, I didn't mind what I was saying. I never expected this. Your mother never told me. I'm sorry. God knows I'm sorry for you, Mary. Well, let's say no more, Jerry, sir. I don't blame you for thinking it's terrible. It's, it's, I suppose it is. Everybody will think the same. It's, it's only as I expected. I'm, I'm sorry all the same. I, I shouldn't have troubled you. I wouldn't had I known. If I can ever do anything for you, Mary... I will. Goodbye, Mary. Is he gone? Yes. Sorry, miss, but we have to live as well as the next man. Here you are. You take that, Isn't this terrible? Suppose you told him everything. Couldn't you have waited for a few days? You just stopped the taking of the things that you'd kept your mouth shut. You're burning to tell everyone of the shame you've brought on us. Oh, God. This is terrible. We'll take the sofa now. <gasps> Mother of God, the light's gone out. Hey, what ailed you? You put the wind up me the way you bawled that time. The aisle's all gone, that's all. Oh, Mother of God, there's a shot I'm after getting. What's wrong with you, man? Is it a fit you're after taking? I'm after feeling a pain in me breast, like the chatting boy of a bullet. That chap's going mad. It's a wonder they'd leave a chap like that here be himself. Who are you? What are you uh, doing here? Quick! Removing uh, furniture that's not paid for. Get over to the other end of the room. Turn faces to wall and keep your hands up. Quick! All right. Uh, Come on, Sean Boyle. You're wanted. Some of us have a word to say to you. Oh, I'm sick. I can't. What do you want with me? Come on, come on. We've a distance to go and we haven't much time. Come on. I'm an old comrade. You just wouldn't shoot an old comrade. Poor Tankard was an old comrade of yours. But you didn't think of that when you gave him away to the gang that sent him to his grave. Ah, we've no time to waste. Come on. Here, Dermot, catch us up. <laughs> Have you your beads? Your beads? Why do you ask me that? Why do you ask me that? Go on, go on, march. Are you going to do in an old comrade? Look at me arm. I lost it for Ireland. Commandant Tankard lost his life for Ireland. Say, pardon, Jesus, have mercy on me. Mother of God, pray for me. Be with me now in the agonies of death. Hey, Mary, what a grace. Lord is with thee. Blessed be the fruit of thy children. Amen. I'll not wait much longer. What did they bring him away in the motor for? Lugin says he thinks they are guns. Is me trouble never going to be over? If anything had happened to poor Johnny, I think I'd lose me mind. I go to the police station. Surely they ought to be able to do something. Question is that someone? Maybe it's your father. When I left him in Foley's, he was hardly able to lift his head. Wish. Mrs. Boyd. Mrs. Boyd. Oh, Mrs. Boyd, God and his blessed mother be with you this night. What is it, Mrs. Madigan? It's Johnny. Something about Johnny. Now, God send it's not. No, God send it's not Johnny. Don't keep me waiting, Mrs. Madigan. I've gone through so much lately that I feel able for anything. 
Two polis men below, wanting you. Wanting me? And what do they want me? Well, some poor fellow's been found, and they think it's... Johnny. Oh, uh, Johnny. Oh, mother. Mother, me poor darling mother. Hush, hush, darling. You'll shortly have your own trouble to bear. And why do the polis think it's Johnny, Mrs. Madigan? Because one of the doctors knew him when he was attending with his poor arm. Oh, it's true, then. It's Johnny. It's me son. Me own son. Oh, it's true, it's true what Jerry Devine says. There isn't a God, there isn't a God, or if there was, he wouldn't let these things happen. Mary, Mary, you mustn't say them things. We'll want all the help we can get from God and his blessed mother now. These things have nothing to do with the will of God. Ah, oh, what can God do against the stupidity of man? The polis want you to go with them to the hospital to see the poor body. They're waiting below. We'll go. Come, Mary, and we'll never come back here again. Let your father forage for himself now. We've done all I could, and it was all no use. He'll be hopeless till the end of his days. I've got a little room in me, sisters, where we'll stop till your trouble is over. And then we walk together for the sake of the baby. My poor little child that'll have no father. It'll have what's fair, better. it'll have two mothers. Are you going to keep us waiting for you all night? Ah, oh, take your hour there. Take your hour. If you're in such a hurry, then skip off, for nobody wants you here. If the ditches wouldn't be found, why is that the same as you were under the British government? Never where you are wanted. As far as I can see, the polis as polis in this city is null and void. We'll go, Mary. We'll go. You to see your poor dead brother. And me to see me poor dead son. Oh, I dread it, Mother. I dread it. We forgot, Mary. I forgot your poor old selfish mother was only thinking of herself. No. No, you mustn't come. It wouldn't be good for you. You go on to me, sisters, and I'll face the ordeal myself. Come on with me, Mary. Come on. Maybe I didn't feel sorry enough for Mrs. Tancred when her poor son was found as Johnny's been found now, because he was a diehard. Ah, uh, why didn't I remember then that he wasn't a diehard or a stater, but only a poor dead son? It's well I remember all that she said. And it's my turn to say it now. What was the pain I suffered, Johnny? Bringing you into the world to carry you to your cradle. To the pains I'll suffer, carrying you out of the world to bring you to your grave. Mother of God. Mother of God, have pity on us all. Blessed Virgin, where were you when me darling son was riddled with bullets? When me darling son was riddled with bullets? Sacred heart of Jesus, take away our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh. Take away this murdering hate and give us thine own eternal love.